In this talk, you won't hear about X-ray or ultrasound or CT, um, all the modalities you may be used to ask for when uh, facing patients with craniosynostosis. Um, here in Berlin, um, we try to do MRI as much as possible. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, overall, I will focus on the intracranial findings um, in these patients. While uh, X-ray obviously lets you down there, ultrasound and CT allow a certain insight, but MRI is definitely uh, the modality of choice. Um, you're going to hear much more about blackbone uh, MRI in the next talk, so um, this is just a quick uh, teaser. Um, yes, we can image sutures um, using uh, dedicated MRI sequences, but you also get a pretty good glimpse uh, just using conventional MRI. Here I, I used uh, a double inversion MPRH, and you can see um, I try to point no? um, You can see um, the uh, lambdoid sutures, the coronal sutures on the, on the left hand side, and even the um, anterior frontal. But I must say, um, the younger the child is, the more difficult it gets because the skull bones are unilaminar uh, in young children and the deep refers first develops the third or fourth year of life. So you're actually trying to image a very, very thin bony structure and that is extremely um, difficult. When you have 3D uh, MRI data available, it's very easy to do uh, a 3D rendering. Um, obviously, you can't see uh, the sutures without doing offline post-processing, but you get a pretty good idea of the head shape, and I actually use that on a regular basis. Um, during the morning session, there was a discussion here uh, about uh, doing 3D photographs in older children or in children with a lot of hair. So in MRI, you won't have this problem. Maybe it's, it's usable. Of course, uh, oh, I show you an example of a young girl with a metopic um, synostosis with a typical uh, trigonocephaly. Of course, you can also see it on on the axial slices um, with the typical bony ridge in the frontal region and the hypertellurism. Um, these uh, 3D rendering can be done at the push of, of a button in nearly all PAC systems. And I find it extremely helpful um, in, um, to differentiate posterior or positional plagiocephaly from uh, unilateral uh, lambert synostosis, as you all know, you would get a more of a trapezoidal head shape in lambert synostosis and contralateral uh, bossing, um, while you get a parallelogram and no bossing in positional plagiocephaly. And again, um, remember to look at the sutures, even on your conventional MRI in uh, lambdoid synostosis, we would often see this uh, contralateral abnormal widening of the sutures, whereas in um, positional plagiocephaly, you have normal, obviously normal and open sutures. Um, I also find it very helpful in, uh, to differentiate these two types of uh, posterior plagiocephaly to draw a line through the internal auditory meatus. And the perpendicular um, red line here um, would deviate from the supratentorial midline into the direction of uh, the lambdoid um, uh, synostosis, whereas it is uh, straight in um, position of plagiocephaly. So what are actually the indication to do an MRI in these patients? Um, well, we want to image the immediate consequences of the abnormal head geometry. Um, that's um, uh, hydrocephalus, and uh, of course, we want to detect uh, signs of increased intracranial pressure if present. Um, 
The abnormal head shape, is especially in lambdoid synostosis, often uh, leads to crowding of the uh, structures in the posterior fossa. Uh, as for example, in this girl um, with croissant syndrome, she has a very small posterior fossa, a very steep tentorium. Um, her cerebellar tonsils wrap around the brain stem. There's nearly no um, perimedulla uh, CSF present, so the brain stem is definitely at risk uh, for um, uh, compression damage. Also note her trucephaly and her abnormal occipital bossing. Um, the, uh, in many of these patients, you would see a herniation of the cerebellar uh, tonsils, and again, uh, you can easily see the brainstem is at risk for um, malaysia. Um, the crowding of the structures in the posterior fossa um, can lead or often lead to an obstruction of the CSF uh, outflow at the level of uh, the foramen magnum. As uh, in this example here, it's a girl uh, with croissant syndrome, um, she has large ventricles, she has hydrocephalus, she has a clear pressure gradient between um, the third ventricle and the prepontine uh, cistern. Um, and you can also see this uh, accentuated flow void in the aqueduct indicating high uh, CSF velocity. Next, we have to uh, find the signs of increased intracranial uh, pressure in these patients. Uh, the dilation of the optic nerve sheath is always a sign uh, of emergency. Um, then you can uh, find papilledema, um, but you really need high-resolution MRI images to, to see that, but actually you don't really need to do that. Um, Remember to look at your diffusion-weighted series where you always can um, diagnose papilledema by these bright signal um, on the B1000 image. Um, increased intracranial pressure can lead to gyral impressions on the inner table of the skull, the so-called uh, copper-beaten uh, skull, which can take on extraordinary uh, dimensions if combined with osseous dysplasia, as in this girl with um, Pfeiffer syndrome. Um, Next, we want to delineate the venous drainage uh, in these uh, patients. Hydrocephalus is actually the result of an um, obstruction of the CSF outflow, but also of impaired venous drainage. By upgrading the venous channels in the skull uh, bones, collateral venous drainage occurs via extracranial venous uh, networks, and that can really take on uh, extreme forms, as in this boy with pansonostosis. His primary venous drainage actually occurs via these venous uh, networks, and his jugular uh, veins are, um, are not developed. Um, here in Berlin at the Charité, we try to avoid CT, but we also try to avoid contrast administration. So it's, of course, it's less impressive on the non-contrast MRI, but you can still see it. I hope you can see it there in, in the neck uh, region, these um, collateral venous uh, networks. And you can always do a non-contrast venous endography, like in the middle uh, of the slide. Um, where you uh, can appreciate these um, neck uh, beams. Um, by the way, we often note this uh, funny bending of, of the straight sinus uh, in these patients. Abnormal uh, venous drainage is very common in uh, syndromic craniosynostosis. This is a very interesting paper from uh, Toronto where they analyzed um, 41 syndromic Craniosynostosis, and they've found very often um, uh, venous sinus stenosis in the posterior fossa, and uh, very often these um, collateral uh, venous networks in the neck region. Finally, we have to find potential uh, associate cerebral uh, malformations, but I must say, 
I don't see them very often, of, although they are uh, regularly described uh, in the radiology um, uh, literature. I'll just show you a few examples. This is a girl with a left-sided synostosis and a frontonasal dysplasia. Um, she has associated cerebellar uh, malformation or dysplasia. Uh, you can see it on the left, left side of the cerebellum with this abnormal fissuration and foliation as well as the abnormal white matter arborization. Another example is a boy with a pansenostosis. Uh, in the other image there, you uh, see a hippocampal uh, malrotation. Hippocampal malrotation we actually see in many uh, CNS malformations, and it's, it's very nonspecific uh, sign. But he also has dysgyria. Dysgyria is an abnormal sulcation and gyration without uh, really showing the features of puppy. Uh, gyria or polymicrogyria. i just show you for, um, for comparison um, a normal uh, central sulcus with a typical hand knob and in this patient you're missing the hand knob and the um, central sulcus is uh, really very straight. He also has the rump encephalus synapsis that is uh, the fusion of uh, both uh, cerebellar hemisphere and a missing uh, vermis that is uh, in the radiology literature described in conjunction with lambda synostosis. And last but not least, um, sometimes we find really various malformations in uh, one patient, as uh, in this boy with croissant. He has a commissural uh, genesis, um, means uh, a missing corpus callosum, extensive dysgyria, uh, and also and synapsis. But as I said, I don't see these malformations uh, very often. Um, and I definitely don't see a specific pattern, maybe because they are so rare and I don't see enough. Um, and that's why we really need to collaborate and collect these cases to gain uh, more insight there. Um, Finally, I just want to remind you that craniosynostosis can be part of more general genetic or metabolic diseases, um, as in this boy um, whom we still do not know the diagnosis of, of his skull gets uh, thicker and uh, thicker, and also his uh, brain tissue increasingly uh, calcifies. I think that these patients may escape the surgeon's eye because they're seen in more general pediatric or neurological consultations. And I, I, I believe there's a lot to do. So um, my take home messages are remember to look at the sutures also on conventional MRI, something we usually forget. Remember to do these uh, 3D reconstructions as it takes two seconds. Um, MRI is highly sensitive to detect uh, increased intracranial pressure much more than CT. And the abnormal venous drainage in the, these patients, especially in syndromic uh, cranial synostosis, are common. Um, on the contrary, I believe that CNS um, affirmations are actually uh, rare. And with that, I would like to thank you.